This talk is about motor examination. These are the class objectives. You do not need to read them. We will use them to chart our talk. The first step of the motor exam is observation. Then evaluate muscle tone, power, reflexes, and lastly assess function. During the motor examination, as well as during the whole of the neuroid examination, think yourself a detective looking for, for clues and remember that, as a famous banker once said, what we see depends mainly on what we look for. So, what to look for? I like to start by looking at the tongue. I look at the tongue primarily searching for fasciculations. Tongue fasciculations reflect lower motor neuron involvement, specifically of the hypoglossal nucleus. Fasciculations can occur all over the body, but a good place to start looking for them is the tongue because the tongue is the only estuated muscle not covered by skin, hence the only estuated muscle that we can normally see. Observation of the body is also important. We should do so looking for fasciculation, but also for nine other conditions, which we will review one by one in the next few minutes. Starting with tremor. Tremor is defined as an involuntary rhythmical alternating movement. It is convenient to classify tremor according to the state during which the tremor occurs. Using this parameter, we can classify tremor as resting, postural, action, and intentional. We will first talk about resting tremor. Resting tremor is often referred to as pill rolling tremor because the tremor resembles a person rolling pills between the index and the thumb. Resting tremors most of the time consist of flexion extension movements at the wrist and fingers. Resting tremor occurs mainly at rest. Frequency of oscillations is low, about 4 per second. The degree of excursion or displacement of the body part involving the tremor is moderate. The location most often involved are the limbs. Resting tremor is most often encountered in patients with Parkinson's disease. The motor manifestation of Parkinson's disease can be easily memorized by remembering that Parkinson's disease traps your body. The T stands for tremor, the R for rigidity, the A for akinesia or bradykinesia, the P stands for postural instability, the first S for shuffling gait, the second S for small handwriting. After resting tremor, we are going to talk about postural tremor. Postural tremor is present while maintaining a position. It is a high frequency tremor, usually 8 hertz or above. The degree of excursion of movement is small. It most often involves the limbs and is found in essential tremor, a familiar condition, and in hyperthyroidism, among other conditions. After postural tremor, we will talk about action tremor. Action tremor is worsened by or only present during movement. It is high frequency, excursion of the body part involved is small, 
location most often involved are the limbs. This tremor usually occurs in conjunction with postural tremor in essential tremor, the condition we previously mentioned. Both components of essential tremor, postural and action tremors, are worsened by anxiety and better by drinking, not recommended, and beta blockers. Action tremor may also occur in association with hyperthyroidism. In this figure, the number of lines by the index and little finger indicate the degree of tremor. In this frame, the hand is far from the target. Tremor is moderate. In this frame, when the arm is closer to the target, the degree of tremor remains the same. This finding is characteristic of action tremor. After action tremor, we're going to talk about intentional tremor. Intentional tremor is often called terminal tremor because it worsens at the end of the movement as the target is being reached. In this figure, the number of lines by the index and little finger again indicates the degree of tremor. When the heart is far from the target, the tremor is moderate. Here, the hand is closer to the target and the number of lines has increased, representing an increase in the degree of intensity of the tremor. Thus, intentional tremor worsened by or is only present as the target is reached. The frequency of oscillation of intentional tremor is initially low but increases as the hand gets closer to the target. The excursion of the oscillation is moderate, especially as the target is reached. Intentional tremor involves mainly the limbs, and this zigzag-like motion is most often seen in alcoholics and other conditions. Next, I'd like to tell you about dystonia. Dystonia is defined as an involuntary contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles leading to a position of extreme flexion or extension. Dystonia can be generalized or focal. Generalized dystonia can be an impressive condition involving the hands, shoulders, neck, and also the lower extremities. Focal dystonia can selectively involve the limbs or the face. Limb involvement is rather common. The most frequent type of focal limb dystonia affects the hand, a condition termed rider's cramp, which can involve one or more than one finger. In the face, dystonia is less frequent. This patient had a rare condition called Schwartz-Champel syndrome. These patients suffer from muscle rigidity, but in addition, they have episode of eyelid dystonia. Eyelid dystonia is called blepharospasms. Next, after dystonia, we will talk about restless leg syndrome. Patients with restless leg syndrome have an urge to move, especially in their legs, and do so at all times of the day, but especially at sleeping time, to the point that the most frequent complaint that drives these patients to see a doctor is insomnia. The urge to move the legs is relieved by moving the legs, but moving the legs keeps the patient awake. Rested leg syndrome is seen in association with metabolic diseases, such as kidney disease, and a search for metabolic condition should always be considered in patients with rested leg syndrome. In some cases, iron deficiency is the cause, and treatment with iron improves sleep. After rested leg syndrome, I'd like to tell you about akathisia. Akathisia is defined as a feeling of inner restlessness and inability to stay still. 
Patients with akathisia are always moving from one place to the other. If sitting, they continuously move their legs, as indicated here, and also the arms are often involved. Akathisia is usually seen in patients taking medications such as neuroleptics and anti-Parkinson medications. Unlike restless leg syndrome, it is not worse at the sleeping time, thus insomnia as an initial complaint is less frequent. Next, I want to tell you about myoclonus. Myoclonus is characterized by sudden brief contractions, as you can see in this frame. Myoclonus is often linked to metabolic disorders involving the liver or the kidney. Next, we will talk about asterixis. Asterixis can be defined as an in inability to actively maintain a position due to sudden loss of muscle tone and consequently to irregular myoclonic lapses of posture. It usually involves the hands, producing a flapping motion. The best way to elicit asterix is, is by asking the patient to stretch his or her arms, as shown in this frame, and then ask them to extend the wrist. This is usually followed by flexion extension movements of the wrist reflecting the involuntary loss of extension tone producing flexion and the voluntary effort to keep the wrist extended. Asterixes are linked to metabolic diseases, especially liver disease. The association of asterixes and liver disease is so strong that during residence we used to call asterix liver flaps. At times, the asterix involved just the finger, giving you the feeling as the patient sits in front of you that the patient is impatient to go. Unilateral asterisk has been linked to a structural lesion in the contralateral hemisphere. Bilateral asterisk has been linked to bilateral lesions. We will expand on this subject in a few minutes. Next, we will talk about chorea. Chorea is defined as an involuntary spasmodic movement, especially of the limbs and facial musculature. This engraving from 1880 depicts these movements. As you can see, they involve the left hand, the right hand, the neck, wrist, leg, foot, and the face. This activity tends to migrate from one area of the body to another in quick succession. Chorea was frequently encountered in Sydenham's Chorea when rheumatic fever was frequent, and currently, when we see it, not often, we see it in patients with Huntington Chorea. In this frame, I have placed the figure of the boy in the middle of the frame to mimic the pattern of movement seen in Korea. Notice as the frames move the changing posture in your screen. So you can appreciate why Korea was called a dance. Now I have added a painting of San Vito. San Vito is the Catholic patron saint of artists and dancers. It was because of these two points, one, that the dystonia looks like a dance, and two, because the patron saint of dancer is called Saint Vito, that Korea was named Saint Vito's Dance. In Germany, in the 13th century, an epidemic of Saint Vito's Dance occurred. This event inspired Peter Bruegel, the younger, to paint this theme. After Korea, we will talk about athetosis. Athetosis is defined as slow, snake-like 
breathing movement, especially of the fingers. As you can see depicted in this frame, in this condition, the hand takes many different and unusual positions. As the one here with fingers extended, here with the thumb contracted, and here with extension of some fingers and flexion of others. A review article titled The Athletoid Syndrome by Foley emphasized the occurrence of this condition following neonatal hypoxic encephalopathy. Next, we will talk about hemibalism. Hemibalism is characterized by sudden while flailing movements involving one side of the body. So now that we have talked about fasciculations and the other nine conditions, we are ready for the following question. What parts of the CNS produces these conditions? We already mentioned that fasciculations are a sign of lower motor neuron involvement either in the anterior horn cells when affecting the body or the hypoglossal nucleus when affecting the tongue. Hence, subsequently, we will talk about what causes the other nine conditions just listed. The CNS structures involved in limb movements can be divided into those that can be seen in the uncut brain specimen and those visible only in the cut brain specimen. Conditions viewed in the uncut specimen occurred as a consequence of cerebral cortical pathology or cerebellar pathology. Conditions viewable in the cut specimens are those affecting the thalamus or the basoganglia. We will start with the cerebral cortex by answering the following question. What areas of the cerebral cortex are involved in generating abnormal limb movements? In this frame, you can see the brain, the left hemisphere, showing the lateral surface, and the right hemisphere, showing the mesial surface. The line just introduced corresponds to the central sulcus. Do not miss the mesial extension of the central sulcus represented in the right paracentral lobuli. The magenta line just added traces the lateral sulcus. Anterior to the central sulcus at the presental gyrus, we find the primary motor cortex, where the distribution of the muscle group takes the form of an homunculus, the face being most inferior, hand and arms superiorly in the lateral surface, and in the mesial region we find the leg and foot. This is a representation of a coronal cut to the primary motor area. And now I have added the homunculus. Notice vocalization is inferiorly with a large area occupying the tongue. Writing is above vocalization and walking occupies the rim of the lateral hemisphere and the mesial surface. Anterior to the primary motor area in the superior zone we find another motor area called the premotor area. Anterior to the primary motor area in the mesial region we find a third general motor area. This is called the SMA which stands for supplementary motor area. Posterior to the central sulcus in the postcentral gyrus we find the primary sensory area which also extends to the mesial cortex. This primary sensory cortex provides a significant number of fibers to the 
pyramidal tract. Epileptiform activity arising from these areas are involved in the generation of abnormal movements. Epileptiform activity in the just mentioned area was the cause of myoclonus in this patient. Next, I would like to say a few words about the cerebellum in relation to abnormal movements. In this view, I am now indicating the cerebellum. Most of the time, cerebellar involvement produces flaccidity, but intentional tremor, also called terminal tremor, may also occur. After the cerebellum, we are going to talk about structures only viewable in the cut specimen. In this frame, I have placed a view of the left hemisphere. The white line here indicates the line of dissection corresponding to this view. I have now added a figure representing the thalamus. You can recognize it as being the thalamus by the geniculi. The arrow just introduced in the cut specimen points to the thalamus, which I have just traced. Unilateral thalamic lesions are the most frequent cause of unilateral asterixis. After considering the thalamus, I'd like to talk to you about the basal ganglia. Here I will mention four structures. The first one I will introduce as a yellow structure is the globus pallidus, the final output nucleus of the basal ganglia. The arrow I have just added indicates to the left and now to the right globus pallidus. Why is the globus pallidus causal? The globus pallidus is called so because globus pallidus in Latin means pale balloon. The arrow in this frame points to the left globus pallidus. Now to the right one. Compare their color with the color of the structures I am pointing to now. Here, 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 and here. No doubt the globus pallidus, as you can see, is much paler than the structures I showed you before. Thinking of them as balloon takes more imagination. Unilateral globus pallidus lesion, as present in this case, may produce contralateral dystonia, as it was in this 27-year-old men with a five-year history of handwriting difficulties. Described in the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry in 2000. Bilateral globus pallidus lesions, as shown here, produce bilateral dystonia. The globus pallidus is the most common site involved in patients with carbon monoxide poisoning. The second basoganglionic structure I like to mention to you I will first represent in the uncut specimen by the green oval structure I just added. It is the subthalamic nucleus which you can see indicated by the arrow in the cut specimen and I have just delineated. The thalamus is above it, hence the name subthalamic nucleus. Here I am pointing to the right subthalamic nucleus, which I have just traced. Injury to this nucleus produces contralateral hemibalism. The third structure, which I am now schematizing in the uncut specimen is the substantia nigra, which I am now indicating in the cut specimen, 
on the left and now on the right. Bilateral damage producing degeneration of DOPA secreting cells in the substantia nigra leads to Parkinson disease, a condition producing many motor manifestations to which we have already alluded. The fourth vasoganglionic structure I will mention to you is the largest of all vasoganglionic structure. It is called the striatum, which I am indicating with the arrow. As you can see, it has a very odd shape. The area of the striatum indicated by the arrow in the uncut specimen corresponds to the area indicated by the arrow in the cut specimen at this point. This area that I am now indicating in the cut specimen corresponds to the area I am now indicating in the uncut specimen. And the area indicated now in the uncut specimen corresponds to the area occupied by the pyramidal tract. The little dark structure I am pointing to in the cut specimen corresponds to the tail of the estriated nucleus. Why is the estriatum called so? This is a fresh specimen. The estriatum, which means the one with the stripes, was appropriately labeled. Here I am indicating to a component of the right estriatum called the caudate nucleus. Notice the stria. Here I am indicating to another component, but this time of the left striatum, called the putamen, which I have selected and enlarged. Notice the internal stripes here, here, and here. You can see why it was called striatum. I have now isolated the uncut specimen of the brain with the superimposed estriatum. Notice the white line, which is the line of the dissection we previously used to yield the uncaused specimen that I have introduced in this frame, which was the same one that we were looking at before. I have now added the figure of the estriatum with the line of cut use as an independent structure in the corner of the frame. I have now isolated the uncut specimen to depict a change in line of the section. Notice that in this view, the brain stem is not cut. This line of cut yield this view. I have now reintroduced the figure of the estriatum and placed a white line on it to indicate the site of the cut at the level of the striatum, represented in this brain label control. This site in the control brain corresponds to the superior part of the striatum indicated in this figure. This site I am indicating in the control brain corresponds to the anterior lower area of the striatum. We will use this control brain to show the changes in the striatum occurring as a consequence of one of the conditions we previously mentioned presenting with chorea. This condition is Huntington's disease. As you can see in the specimen I have just added of a patient that suffered this condition, large part of the striatum is gone especially the part close to the ventricles. Now we will go back to the figure showing the general order of motor examination. After observation, we move to tone evaluation. The best way to examine tone is while having a silly conversation. So engage the patient as you move to do the tone examination. To a start, Check hip tone. Hold the knee as you can see here. 
roll the leg on the bed. It is normal if you feel minimal resistance. It is abnormal if you feel significant resistance, indicating increased tone, or if you feel no resistance, indicating flaccidity. Next, check tone at the knee. Do so by grabbing the knee and pulling it quickly. It is normal if you feel a slight resistance and the heel lifts off the bed minimally. It is abnormal if you feel a strong resistance indicating increased tone or if the heel lifts off from the bed significantly, also indicating increased tone. Knee tone is also abnormal if there is no resistance indicating flaccidity or if the heel does not lift off the bed at all, also indicating flaccidity. Then go to evaluation of the ankle tone. Initially, we test dorsiflexion by quickly pushing the foot up. It is normal if you feel a slight resistance and provoke no clonus. It is abnormal if you feel a strong resistance indicating increased tone or elicit clonus, also indicating increased tone. Ankle tone is also abnormal if there is no resistance, implying flaccidity. Next, you check plantar flexion by moving the foot down. It is normal if you feel slight resistance. It is abnormal if you feel a strong resistance, implying increased tone, or if you feel no resistance, implying flaccidity. Next, we go to the upper extremities and follow fundamentally the same principles. Mosh will be learned by holding the hand, as you can see here, and then moving it up and down several times, as indicated by the arrows, then supinating and pronating the patient's arm and rotating the wrist. Tone interpretation in the upper extremity is the same as in the lower extremity. Normal if you feel a slight resistance, abnormal low if you feel no resistance, and abnormally high if you feel a strong resistance. As you have noticed, I have used the word tone up to imply increased resistance, but what does it mean? Do all increased resistance means the same thing? Tone up is classified based on the characteristics of the resistance. When there is sudden increase in resistance as the limb is moved, it is called clasp knife resistance. Some neurologists use the term spasticity to refer to this type of increased tone, where as other neurologists believe spasticity should be classified as a separate condition and not as a type of rigidity, but for now we will leave it in this classification. I do not know how many of you have handled a clasp knife. Those of you who have, I am sure remember that after resisting being shot, the blade suddenly gives way and closes in a chippy which is the characteristic of this type of rigidity. Spasticity is a sign of involving descending motor tracts, usually including the pyramidal tract. A simulation of clasp knife rigidity is nicely represented in this video that you can find in YouTube. Next type of increased assistant I will mention to you consists of Increased tone without intensity changes throughout the whole range of limb excursion. This type of resistance is called 
lead pipe resistance. I am sure none of you, and I, and I can assure you that I have not bended a lead pipe, but this is how a bent pipe looks like. Lead pipe rigidity implies that the resistance is felt equally throughout the limb excursion, as we have previously mentioned. An example of lead pipe resistance is presented in YouTube, but the reality is that tone has to be felt and not few to develop a feeling for it. Another type of increased resistance is characterized by regular intermittent breaks in tone throughout the whole range of motion. This type of rigidity is called cogwheel rigidity. This is what a cogwheel looks like. A good simulation of cogwheel rigidity can be seen in the second part of this video. Lead pipe rigidity and cogwheel rigidity can be seen with globus pallidus and a striatum pathology, but it is most characteristic of substantia nigra pathology due to the generation of dopa secreting cells in the pars compacta in this nucleus. The fourth type of rigidity I would like to mention is a speed dependent rigidity. This type of rigidity is called paratonia or Gagenhalten. Paratonia is characterized by finding low resistance when you move the limb of the patient slowly and a strong resistance when you attempt to move the limb of the patient rapidly. This type of rigidity is often found in dementia, especially if frontal lobes are affected. Go to YouTube to see examples of it. After tone, we check power. How is power graded? Power is graded based on observation and confrontation testing. The grading system most often used is called by some the system of five. This is so because it is based on grading normal muscle tone as five and comparing the patient's muscle tone to normalcy. Hence, a patient's tone can be graded from zero to five. The meaning of this grading scale will be explained in this table. No contraction is zero. Muscle flicker, but no movement, is one. Movement present, but not against gravity, is two. Movement against gravity, but not against resistance applied by the examiners, is three. Movement against gravity and against some resistance applied by the examiner, is four. And normal strength is five. How is this done? If the patient is laying down, you should ask the patient to move the area you want to evaluate. For example, if you say move the left leg and you see no movement in a cooperative patient, the grading should be one or less. No response to oral command demands using different stimuli but the classification of motor power is the same. The next step is then to touch the area being tested, sort of holding onto it to see if you perceive any muscle contraction. If no flicker of contraction is felt, motor grading is zero over five. If flicker is present, motor grading is one over five. If following the initial command, horizontal movements are present, but movements against gravity are not, motor power should be graded 2 over 5. If in addition to movement in the horizontal plane, movement against gravity are present, muscle power is 
3 over 5 or more. If movement against gravity are present, but minimal pressure can overcome it, motor power rating should be 3 over 5. If the force applied in order to overcome patient's power is relatively strong and the patient's power is overwhelmed by it, the grading is 4 over 5. If the patient maintains the position despite heavy pressure, thus the patient power is not overcome by the examiner, then the power is graded 5 over 5. This process is done for the different muscle groups or isolated muscles as required in the lower and in the upper extremities. Before leaving the subject of power, that is creating power, we have to answer one question. Can weakness be faked? The short answer is yes. Generalized and local weakness can have an organic basis, be the manifestation of a mental illness, or be faked for conscious secondary gain. Non-organic weakness often manifests as inability to move a leg or an arm drop. I will show examples and tell you when to suspect non-organic weakness in three situations. The first situation is when a patient is laying down and not being able to move one leg. Let's say you ask a patient to raise their right leg, the leg the patient is saying cannot be moved. The patient will reply, I cannot. You hold the leg and perceive no flicker at the time of your request. So you would then consider hip flexion of the right leg to be 0 over 5. Then you ask the patient to move the right leg down, that is to extend the right leg. And the same thing happens, no movements and you feel no flicker. Then you ask the patient to raise the left leg up. The patient says, OK, and does so. Then you see that as the leg goes up, his right arm will push down as indicated by the arrow and the patient will extend the right hip again as indicated by the arrow. If after feeling no flicker of movement in the right leg you had kept your hand holding the right leg you will also feel movement at this time. The discrepancy between the lack of voluntary hip extension and the presence of non-voluntary hip extension is called Hoover sign. The second situation in which we encounter a similar issue is when the examination is being conducted with a patient sitting and the patient complains of inability to extend the hip, let's say the left hip. The way to elicit Hoover sign in this situation is by lifting the left thigh up and asking the patient to push against your hand and you feel no action. Then keeping your hand in the same place but placing your other hand on the other thigh as shown here, you ask the patient to lift the right leg. As the patient raises the right leg, you will feel the extension of the left hip. The third situation we often encounter non-organic weakness is when evaluating arm posture. In such situation, we ask the patient to keep arms straight forward for 10 seconds. But a few seconds after putting the arms up, the arm drops without the relation between the position of the arm and the hand changing. This usually implies non-organic weakness. A patient with organic weakness, if unable to hold an arm up, 
as the arm drops, the relation between the position of the arm and the hand changes. There would be pronation of the forearm as indicated by the arrow. Power of individual muscle or muscle group is also tested by confrontation. During confrontation testing, the examiners use their own strength as control. Confrontation testing of individual muscles or muscle groups will not be reviewed in this video. After evaluating power, we test reflexes. Stretched reflexes are triggered by stretching the muscle and exciting the muscle spindles. In the lower extremity, we traditionally evaluate three stretched reflexes. Starting distally, the first one is the calcaneus tendon reflex. This reflex is triggered by tapping on the calcaneus tendon, thus stretching the muscles that insert in this tendon, primarily the soleus and the gastronemius. The electrical activity generated by this stretch travels in the tibial nerve sensory fibers, here represented in green, ultimately arriving at the spinal cord and making contact with a neuron innervating these muscles at the C1-S2 spinal segment and returning back to these muscles via the tibial nerve again. This circuit is referred to as the myotatic reflex. Stretch reflexes are graded as zero if not found, one plus if decreased, two plus if normal, three plus if increased, four plus if very increased. All stretch reflexes are graded in the same fashion. The second reflex we usually check in the lower extremities is the patella reflex. The patella reflex is tested by placing the patient's leg flexed at roughly 60 degrees, taking the entire weight of the leg on your arm and hitting the patella tendon with a tendon hammer. It is vital to get your patient relaxed as much as possible and for you to take the entire weight of the leg in order for this reflex to be detected most of the time. This reflex is at times difficult to obtain as we have just mentioned. In those cases we can reinforce it by having the patient hook together their flex fingers and pulling apart as shown in this figure. This procedure is known as the Jendrasic procedure or maneuver. Tapping the patella tendon stretches the quadriceps. The electrical activity generated at the muscle spindle travels in the sensory fibers of the femoral nerve to the L2 to L4 segments in the spine and back to the femoral nerve again. The third reflex is the medial hamstring reflex is elicited by tapping the lower tendons of the semitendinous and semimembranous muscles just above the knee. The electrical impulse travels in the sciatic nerve sensory fibers to reach the spinal segments of L5 to S2 and back through the sciatic nerve to contract the same muscles. In the upper extremity, we traditionally evaluate also three reflexes. At times, clenching the teeth helps bringing them out. The first one, starting from distal to proximal, is the brachioradialis reflex. This reflex is obtained by tapping the distal tendon of the brachialis muscle. The electrical activity generated at the spindle travels through the radial nerve sensory fibers to the C5 and C6 spinal segments, returning through the radial nerve after making contact with the motor neuron leading to contraction of this muscle. The second one 
is the biceps. The distal tendon of the bicep is stretched. Electrical activity generated at the spindle travels through the musculocutaneous nerve sensory fibers to reach C5 and C6 segments. From there, the motor neuron activates the biceps. The third reflex is the triceps. The tricep reflex is obtained by tapping the distal tendon of the triceps. Electrical activity travels in the radial nerve sensory fibers, reaching the spinal segment of C7 and C8. The motor neuron activates the tricep through the radial nerve again. Before leaving the subject of stretch reflexes, it is important to mention that in addition to stimulating the motor neuron of the muscle being stretched, that is the agonist muscle, the sensory neuron polysynaptically inhibits the antagonist muscle. In the case of the tricep, for example, as the tricep contracts, elbow flexors relax. Other reflexes, called primitive reflexes, can be tested during motor examination, but only one of them, the plantar reflex, is tested regularly. The primitive reflexes are called so because most of them are present at birth and normally disappeared within the first year of life. These reflexes, if present bilaterally in an adult, usually indicates bilateral encephalopathy involving the frontal lobes. On the other hand, if present only on one side, they always indicate unilateral frontal lobe disease. I will mention six primitive reflexes. The first one is the grasp or palmer reflex. This reflex is elicited by putting your fingers in the patient's palm and as you pull your fingers away, asking the patient not to grab your fingers. It is normal if there is no grabbing. It is abnormal if grabbing occurs. The second one is the palmomental reflex. This reflex is elicited by stretching the palm, as you see here. It is normal if no shin contraction occurs. It is abnormal if ipsilateral shin muscle contraction occurs. You can see examples of this in YouTube. The third primitive reflex is the snout reflex. It is triggered by tapping the philtrum, as you can see in this frame. No reaction is normal. Puckering of the lips is abnormal. The fourth primitive reflex I want to mention is rooting. Rooting is elicited by stroking the skin in the upper or lower lip in a lateral direction as indicated by the arrow. It is normal if no reactions occur. It is abnormal if the lip moves as if to take the object to the mouth. The fifth reflex is sucking. The maneuver to elicit this reflex is by placing an object in the patient's mouth. It is normal if nothing happens. It is abnormal if sucking movements appear. The sixth primitive reflex, the one regularly tested during motor examination is the plantal reflex. This reflex is elicited by stimulating the plantal region as indicated by the arrow. The normal response is flexion of the toes, which implies no Babinski. And a normal result is a Babinski sign. It consists of extension of the big toe and either fanning as represented here by the magenta arrow or flexion of the toes as represented here by the yellow arrow. You have to be careful because if all toes extend 
and the foot dorsiflex. It is a withdrawal response and not a Babinski sign. So we are done with reflex evaluation and we will proceed to functional testing. It is important to keep in mind when talking about functional testing that if a patient complains of a specific activity, we have to make sure that, if possible, the activity is performed at the time of the visit, or else ask the patient to video the activity so we can actually see it. Otherwise, in a regular basis, I test walking, tapping with the feet, arm rolling backwards and forward when there is a unilateral weakness the good arm rotates and the bad one stays fixed and become the axis of the rotation. After arm rolling, I check arm flexion at the shoulder, that is arm forward as you can see in this frame, finger to nose with eye open, finger to finger, opposite hand turning, hand tapping, touching the thumb with all the fingers, and occasionally I ask them to write. Functional motor testing gives a gestalt impression of the motor system, not only of the pyramidal system, but also of the lower motor neuron, cerebellum, and basal ganglia. Thank you very much for your attention.